I mean, the gay scene has totally changed. It, to some extent, it was underground mm -hmm. when I first began to participate in it. It was like, you know, it had that uh, out, strong outsider uh, feeling to it, mm -hmm. which is kind of exciting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, outlaw, sort of. Yeah, yeah. But that's totally changed. It's not, and now, <laughs> now it's like, uh, it, it's sort of banal at this point. Yeah, you know it's perfectly ordinary. They're 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 no longer gay ghettos, really. I guess some in West Hollywood maybe, but uh, even that mo now they're all living in the suburbs or wherever. You know. Welcome to what's my thesis. I'm your host Javier Proenza, and today my guest is Patrick Donovan. Uh, we are at Last Projects at his show uh, Man in a Ring Mold, which I had to look up. I was uh, <laughs> I didn't know what a ring mold was. Uh, right. Do you want to describe what that is? Uh, a ring mold is a, it's a cooking implement. Uh huh. Uh, and that one, the one on the, sh on the uh, in the painting, happens to be one uh, that belonged to my mother, I think. I'm pretty sure, which I seem to have inherited for some reason. And uh, you make like it's like a '50s thing, 1950s thing, like Jello, which is very popular in the '50s. And yeah, that is a fun thing. That she <laughs> used to make tomato uh, V8 juice. Jello, sort of. What? She seemed to think that was very healthy, yeah. So what, did that right. taste good? Actually, as I recall, it wasn't too bad. But. I mean, I, like, I've never had savory Jello. That sounds yeah. like it could possibly... I mean, I like V8, so you, you, yeah, you kind of have... Yeah, yeah. Um, But that is... I feel like that's a very 90s thing. When did, when did V8... Like, 90s? Has uh, it been around for much longer? Because I just remember becoming really aware of it in the 90s. Well, it was, it was around in the 1950s when I was a child. Yeah, it was okay. uh, very popular, yeah. Well, and how healthy it is, I'm not sure because it's very health. It's very salty. Yeah, yeah, I'm but, sure it's got yeah, but, sodium. But it's delicious. It's they formulate it to be delicious, so it is. Yeah. I recently um, looked up also. I, I, do you when you go on airplanes? I, apparently, it's a thing that other people have as well. They get a craving for tomato juice. And airplanes. Okay. Yeah, and, and and so I googled. I actually googled why like uh, why do airplanes um, provide tomato juice? Like, why do they serve it? And it's and it the answer that came up was to the question of like uh, why do you crave it because it's one of the most savor like one of the strongest flavor things that you can get up there in the air like it has and it, it's just interesting because I do I like every time I have it's either that or ginger ale <laughs> not to plug uh, Canada Dry or maybe they think it's a Virgin Mary a non alcoholic drink no well, tomatoes are delicious yeah and it's interesting that they're a New World vegetable. Uh -huh. So, and then they were imported to uh, Europe. Yeah. In, uh, I'm not sure when, 15th century, 16th century, around then, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, after, obviously after Columbus, yeah. Yeah. Right. But that's crazy because, I mean, you think of Italian cooking without tomatoes. Right. And that, like, what was that? Like? Uh, it was like the t potatoes <laughs> were also a New World thing. Really? Yeah, and they were uh, uh, exported at some point, yeah. yeah. So then why the man in the ring mold, if, if we can... Why the man in the ring mold? Well, most of these paintings, I, I, they're sort of, a, I don't really have a necessarily a preconceived idea of what they're about, or they sort of develop. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, that one's from a photograph I took of a model, and then I modified it to, modified the face, because I was interested in a, an artist, by the name of, a Renaissance artist, by the mannerist artist, by the name of Pontormo. Mm -hmm. So he, all his figures, they look. A lot of them look worried. Uh, they're anxious. Uh, he exaggerates the eyes. So they did that, and then I decided it would be good to add the, uh, the uh, the ring mold. The ring mold, right? <laughs> so I mean, you know, so it, it, what it mean? I think most artists uh, they paint what they want to paint, or f paint what they feel like making, uh -huh. and then they figure out what it means afterwards. Yeah, yeah, that's totally fair, though. <laughs> right. <laughs> some some are more rigorous and they have a something they're dealing with like I'm wor like I'm worried about uh, or some are I'm interested in color or how it relates to this and they explore all the permutations and stuff of uh, yeah of color but uh, so that works too but yeah and which which camp would you say you fall into uh, I mean the first one I don't have a uh, you know you you never you you usually work from that standpoint you just kind of go with it. Right. You yeah. have an idea of how to make a painting, and then you just do it and add things or subtract things yeah, as you go along. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting, just because, I mean, it does. it is a cohesive show, so 
I, 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 I'm glad you said that because I worry because <laughs> I worried about sometimes to me when I maybe it's because you're making they look some of them look very different to me than than other ones. Yeah. You know. Well, right. but I mean, thematically, like the, it, it is just figures in space and, yeah. so, you know, sometimes there's an actual space or sometimes it's just like an expanse. Yeah. Uh, but the, you know, the main figure is kind of their, their, their body language or their, their, um, I always find it like, I just even realized that we're talking about figurative work, <laughs> which is like, you right. know, uh, it, it's a very difficult thing I find for me from a standpoint to like for me to separate like as as i'm making it as a maker uh um from like you know all of these uh like it's almost like bougie preconceived academic notions of like right. what concept like what is contemporary painting and what is relevant but like i it i it it, it, it seems beside the point in this show right like it just it I, no, who cares <laughs> do, do you right. get what it, does does what do you yeah. Well, I, and it's a compliment. I'm just saying, like, I right. feel like it transcends. Like, I, I don't feel like I'm in a figurative show. I feel like I'm in a show that where something interesting is happening, and it's not just like, uh, I, um, someone's lawyer, uh, the wife of a lawyer who like paints on her spare time. You know, mm -hmm. uh, not to dig it, but I'm just saying, like, someone that has like a hobby practice versus like an actual like. Well, well, I, I worry about that. Uh, I worry about the the painting style because it does use academic techniques. Yeah, yeah. Like this one is. I mean, it's also potentially a Man and a parody of uh, like Dutch mm -hmm. paintings where they have the white collar around them. But I do worry about the uh, technique as being maybe it's too traditional or something like that. Well, yeah. But uh, but at, at the, in, the, in the current environment, almost anything goes. Yeah, yeah. Because there are painters who do very traditional work. They're not, but and they're not labeled as hopelessly academic or hopelessly retrograde. You know what I mean? They're, uh, yeah, yeah. They're, they're seem to be accepted. But, People uh, are still allowed to make modernist art, too. Right, you know, but, like, but, I mean, not that that's what you're making, but I'm just saying, like, the, the broad sense of it. And then there's, like, you know uh, Emmanuel Galvez, right? Uh, he he's friends with Alex. He also oh, yeah. he he paints representational and uh -huh. abstract, and he, right. like that didn't exist when I was a kid or right. when I was going right. to school. The idea that you could do both. <laughs> well, a lot of artists want to have a signature style. When yeah. you go when you go to a uh, contemporary art gallery now, normally you're f frequently going to see paintings that have a very similar approach. You know, they, uh -huh. they don't. You can tell they're all by the same artist, and there's absolutely yeah. no question they're they're doing one. It's like a body of work. That's that's what they're doing. That's sort of like a sig, you know. A lot of artists want to have a signature style. Uh huh. Part How do you of, feel about that? Part well, I I, I feel like uh, well, I'm glad you said that it looks unified because I my signature maybe my signature style is to paint in this particular way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as opposed to uh, something else, but I sometimes I feel like I don't have a signature style, but I don't. Uh, well, I mean, yeah. signature style. That's an interesting idea. I because I come from a more conceptual background. So, like, yeah. I get what you're saying. Right. I find that it's almost hard to break out of a signature style. You know, like, because right. it, it, I've done a, a lot of work that's, like, I, I, I'm I not trying to make it all <laughs> have a style, but it ends right. up doing that, right? right? Which is why, like, I've gone and really started working with color. But I, but it is, it, is a, it, it is an interesting thing. Well, when I, when I was a... Uh, I think for commercial purposes, a signature yeah. style is, is right. helpful. Go ahead, sorry. Right. Well, when I was in uh, uh, an art school in San Francisco, we we had visiting artists, and one of them was Jim Shaw, uh -huh. and he came and he said, "Oh, I don't want to have a signature style. I was never interested in that." But when you look at his work, he does have a signature style. You have a perspective. Maybe he doesn't know it. Yeah, or, it's very good. And uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, no, but, but it, I mean, I do feel like there's a point of view. I know you were concerned about some of the paintings being a little too different or f feeling different to you, but I think that like. You know, not to like call them out in particular because I don't want I don't I don't want to like. Oh, go ahead. It's oh, okay. Well, yeah. well, you you used some AI as as source imagery, right? right? Yeah, but but more what I'm interested in is that you know you have the the pieces like again the, I said it before, but like they're in space even when they're not in space, right? Like mm -hmm. like the and uh, you you know you've got the gentleman with the and there's just random stuff too. <laughs> like you're you're kind of like when there is stuff going on. It in the background, it's part of the thing. It's not a distraction, right? Like mm -hmm. whereas, like you have these two gentlemen that are 
helping each other out and uh they're like they're in absolute like you know there's nothing there's no background right it's right. just negative space which is, is interesting like I would say I would imagine like if you were in art school and your your uh, your professor would be like, well, you have to pick one, you know, whereas you might not get to what you got to by by just like no, this one has this, this one doesn't, you know. Right. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. You're, yeah. You're right. Uh, and uh, that one also sort of developed. At one point, it had a background. Oh, okay. It had a, They were sitting on the chair, and I didn't decided I didn't like it, so I just wiped it out, and. Uh, but I think it look. I like the, I like the colors. The uh, yeah, yeah. Sort of reduced palette. I yeah, I like the way it works. Yeah. No, totally. Um, when did you When did you start painting? When did you start getting into becoming an uh, art person? Because I know uh, you. Because I know you told <laughs> me that you maybe you you had a different career at some point. I had a different career yeah, in Washington D.C. I made some paintings in uh, a couple of paintings in high school, which I still have. Oh, cool. And then I didn't do any artwork for about 30 years 35 years jesus how did you survive <laughs> <laughs> i mean i'm probably you probably ate I, very well <laughs> well I, w I was always interested in art and i went to shows and stuff uh -huh. like that but i never never occurred to me to actually do it but then i decided i started and this part worries me because uh i started taking courses sometimes literally on a sunday at the one of the art schools in washington to, and where they teach this type of painting mm -hmm. And so you're always worried about, you know, your profile of being labeled a uh, Sunday painter. You're not, yeah, yeah. you know, you're an amateur painter. And I feel the same way when I meet someone who tells me they were, uh, used to be a doctor, or used to be a lawyer, and I'm painting, I say, uh-oh. You know? <laughs> so I can fully sympathize with uh, their, uh, you know, that point of view, because it occurs to me also. But, yeah. But, uh, yeah, but I mean, but then, go ahead. Sorry, uh, I was gonna, I was gonna build like, you know, obviously it's good to also not struggle <laughs> and starve, well, and I'm sure you work at, it benefits from that too, right? Well, yeah, I didn't have to worry about eating or a place to live and so forth. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I then I did that for a few years, and then I uh, was getting tired of work, so I just decided to stop doing that. And yeah, yeah. So that's how that happened. Yeah. Yeah. How, so, uh, was it like? Was it pre-retirement age that you retired and then decided to make art, or no? It's about retirement age. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. 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 I mean, but I like really, honestly, the more I, I do this interview thing, the more I realize like it takes time. To, I I did not have really anything to say, as uh, or right. I have more to say now. The older yeah. I get, like, right. So, that, that I do like to like talk to older artists because it. First of all, there's like a generational. Uh, thing that you learn from like different perspectives but also just mm -hmm. the life experience that goes into a piece is mm -hmm. is a lot you know like it it really is it you you don't make art about nothing so like when i was in school in my 20s <laughs> i really didn't have enough life experience to really right. like have it like i remember teachers telling me like you you can't take photographs of walls of dilapidated walls you haven't earned that and right. and and I it was obnoxious, but I I can I still I get it now. You know, it's like everybody does that. You know, it's like when teachers right. don't want you to take pictures of dogs. Someone recently I interviewed, they told me that they 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 tell their students they are not allowed to manufacture wings, in the and like apparently wings are a big thing that art school kids are doing now. It's in the zeitgeist. I mean, the wings where you like on the wall and people back up and take photographs so it looks like you have wings no i think they're of... actually fabricating like constructing oh. like it's oh. a sculpture class but oh. but i mean it's not too far off yeah. right like it's right. still the same sentiment well they're sort of saying you got to put in your time you got to do pay your dues or something like that yeah I don't know, but uh, it can make sense but then there are artists who are young and they're you know they're great right off the yeah yeah, right yeah. Off the, uh, like hockney he was his first show from school was uh, sold out and he's been selling out ever since. He's like, there's no, he has had no lull. Yeah, can you I've imagine? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I always, I also like to think. Well, we were talking before, as uh, we, like I was, as I was setting up that, like I, uh, I kind of really want this to be my day job because, mm -hmm. and the re I didn't explain why, but like I just don't know that I could handle the pressure of like my success, my success in the arts world of paint selling work. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a lot of pressure to, to have your your livelihood attached to your art practice 
like that. I, I've, I mean, to me, that as a concept, that's like crazy. Because De Chirico, you know, you know who he was, right? Like he's the oh. Italian. Uh, De Chirico. Oh, I, yeah, forget, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I forget what his first name was. Maybe he's just a one name guy. Uh-huh. But I went to his. Um, he has like a an apartment that, or the, his apartment is still open for tourism, and you see his paintings, and they as they. T- they tell you about the time where he tried to stop painting like De Chirico, mm. and he started to, ha- he actually had to go back to it because no one was buying the work. Like right. he had to redevelop, like go back into making the pieces that he was kind of over with, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's a, that's an interesting, like. Well, art is a, uh, yeah, it has that, uh, it's uncertain. Yeah. Because even artists who are successful for a time, then they can have lulls and they may have a permanent lull or. Like Rembrandt died, and we all know who died in poverty and so forth. And yeah. even artists now, when you when you follow someone for a number of years, they have they have a great idea, and it's it works well. But then, yeah, you know, everyone who wants one of the works has already bought one, so yeah, no one, you know, so it's, it's it can be precarious, yeah, for sure. But uh, and then there's oh, sorry, we're gonna say something. But then the, the upside is, you know, you have a lot of benefits. You're self-employed. You uh, yeah. Don't have a boss. You have to deal with. Uh, your, you get to make your own stuff and your own ideas. Well, so I'm definitely with the uh, self-employed part. Yeah, right. that, yeah. <laughs> that so, I get. <laughs> in a way, it, 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 you don't risk uh, alienation. You yeah. know, like you do if you're in a job doing something that someone else, but basically someone else is directing. Yeah. And there's no it, HR department. Right. There's no one telling you what to do or how to do it. So you have the. It's sort of like a professional aspect where you get to decide. Yeah. What to do. Of course, that is a risk. Someone may not let, no one may not, no one may like what you're doing, but you know. Yeah. So. But then it's also, it's, it, 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 that, that's a valid, like, and I totally agree with you, but then there's also the, the, the school of thought that's like purist, right? That, that comes from a very, um, secure job, but people, from a generation of people that had very secure jobs in tenure. And, you know, were 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 uh, waxing philosophical while they didn't have to fight it. Well, their while their art philosophy was not tied to the capitalist hustle, you know. Right. <laughs> Which is an interesting. Like the whole art landscape is so broad and and random and um, and any sense of purity to me is so adorable. <laughs> so adorable. Yeah. Yeah. It's like right. when has art ever been pure? I mean, the expression of it, yes, but like the. The market, I mean, come on. <laughs> well, it seems like the market is the key. Uh, it seems to be the driving. Well, I guess it's always been that way. I mean, even the even the uh, uh, famous artists we know about, when people began to identify specific artists, uh, did it on, uh, they were uh, paid to make their art. I mean, they were commissioned. Basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's uh, nothing new, although... The, it's kind of a relatively new thing, I think, where artists just made their own thing without being commissioned yeah. and expect people to buy it. New, <laughs> new, new, yeah. new in the sense of like maybe towards the, uh, must have been the 19th century or something. Like yeah, that. yeah. Where, uh, yeah, where, where everything up until then was probably artisanal, like utilitarian that got sold, that got made with the expectation of selling where, as opposed to like, this is my pure thought or, you know my idea right well, and the way it's kind of conceited this is my idea this is what i like <laughs> and it's worth spending a lot of money on it. oh like, we're such a narcissist i love it <laughs> all right you know, so, yeah. yeah well then what what okay so then what really got you into like what what got you into painting like i mean obviously you were you you did the weekend thing and stuff like that but you could have been into basketball you could have been into like you know, hiking yeah. and camping and being an outdoors person. It's right. a very specific, like, uh, well, burden. <laughs> like, I, like I said, I was always interested in it, and I made yeah. it in high school. So I don't know. It was just something that uh, you're interested in. Did you, you know, pa- like, did you ever have the desire to, like, sidestep everything and just go into art making? Well, it like, never really occurred to me because it was, seemed so totally unrealistic. And What year were you born in? You said you grew up in the 50s. 1948. 48. Okay. So you're around my parents' age. Yeah. 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 I think my mom was born in 49. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, like, what uh, that, that, I'm, uh, first of all, 
Did you have a topic that you wanted to talk about? No, not particularly. Oh, okay. no agenda, no agenda. I just, I just no want agenda. to make yeah. sure before I start like digging in because I'm, I find okay. So you no, know, help yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see the the the, the, <laughs> the greedy eyes. <laughs> um, so okay, so the 1950s. All right, what is like America? 1950s you're born in 48 so you're about five years old six years old let's say it's in in 19 what 1955 you're already somewhat you're starting to have memories right yeah okay tell me what those are <laughs> of what, like what would like what was the culture growing up well, as in your early childhood well i grew up in uh northern virginia which okay. was a liberal community uh -huh. but there was no art scene to speak of it was just like totally The, the the art scene was like the National Gallery, yeah, yeah. like these old master paintings. There were some other galleries, but I was totally unaware of them. My, my parents would go take me to the um, father would take me to the National Gallery, but in terms of atmosphere, it was I think people today would consider it very conservative, mm -hmm. although they. Uh, well, liberal is like is pretty conservative. People forget that it's like Margaret Thatcherism. <laughs> and Ronald Reaganism, uh, <laughs> neoliberalism. Well, I, I wouldn't uh, neoliberal, yeah, but I, would, I wouldn't <laughs> oh, call. Oh. I wouldn't call them classical. Liberal. Classical liberals. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So we're we're not using we're not using the abridged neoliberal. They are actual liberals that believed right. in in um, the middle class and workers' rights and stuff right. like that. Right, and they believed the government. They were not so totally opposed to any government action yeah. whatsoever. Neoliberals are uh, believe the government should get out of practically everything. Yeah. yeah. And it should have basically no role at all. Except for like... Uh, national defense or something like yeah, that. Yeah, right? yeah. Maybe taking care of the very, very poorest people. But anything else is, you know, f should be the free market, right? Yeah. All right. So sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so it was kind of conservative. So in terms of art, it was just like not something that was on the table. Mm -hmm. Well, I did have some friends that were in art. And uh, it, there were some people in my age group who went on, like David Lynch. He was... He was uh, grew up in the same uh, city. Wait, sorry, what was the city again? Alexandria, Virginia. Okay, uh, I remember the Virginia part, but I, w I wanted to get because I I used to hang out there. I I, I grew up in Bethesda for or, oh, or I lived in Bethesda in my late or in my early twenties with oh, my with that. my family. Oh. Yeah, oh. so I'm familiar with the area. Yeah. My, I mean, my parents are UN people, so we're like part of the uh, that industrial oh, complex. Of, oh, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Of oh. the uh, like, he he worked for the for FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, oh. uh, and this was before billionaires were li like Bill Gates were funding the WHO and whatnot. Like when <laughs> these institutions were right. a little bit less, uh, but they were still neoliberal in the mm -hmm. in the contemporary sense. But they oh, yeah. they, they were not uh, as. Because uh, oh, my my father worked for the State Department, so. Oh really? Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. In fact, he was in the. Uh, Cultural Affairs Division. Oh wow! Which maybe that maybe that was one reason why. No, my parents were always uh, interested in sort of intellectual things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they yeah. read like Partisan Review and uh, all that sort of highbrow there, highbrow things. I feel like so, that's died down, and it's been yeah. replaced by like a diluted uh, simula a simulation of it. You know, like it, it's not. They, people think they're intellectuals because they've gone to schools, but they don't read shit. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you know? right. Right. The attention span has disappeared, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's hard to remember what it was like. There was no internet and no, yeah, barely television. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. That right. access yeah. to so much information has made us a little dumber in some ways. You know? Yeah, I love it being able to look up anything at the spur of the moment. It's great. Yeah. yeah. But we don't have stuff like the... Um, Gore Vidal and like William F. Buckley, even though that's like straight up culture war, like th that culture war was a little bit more sophisticated. <laughs> like when you see the 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 best of friends, the best of rivals, or whatever. I've only seen that documentary. I didn't live through it, so <laughs> uh, no, I... it sounds like you have a different perspective. Well, in the fifties, there was like uh, the sources of information were so uh, limited compared to what it is now. Where they were like the authoritative figures were like. You know the, the three major networks, or you have three or four magazines like Time or, or uh, Newsweek or Life magazine. That's where you got. I remember for art, you read Time magazine, which was, which was totally mainstream. Yeah, yeah. And about as conventional, you know, as you can get. But that was, that was really it. Now it's you just you know you, so many things. Yeah, yeah. You can read and get you know yeah. 
Would so then were you at all a radical in the '60s and that kind of like? I mean, my parents were kind of not really, but a little. They were rebellious, but they weren't like Abby Hoffman level. Right. Like outside, they weren't yippies. They were hippies. Well, did you ever? Did you ever have to? I mean, because you were not necessarily working in an industry where it would have been okay right. <laughs> for you well, to be a radical. Yeah, of or, course. When I was in college, the big thing was the Vietnam War. Yeah. And. Uh, I mean, I supported the anti-war movement. I was a, uh, I attended the, uh, the some of the rally marches in Washington D.C. I was like a, a marshal for one of them. I can't remember exactly what I did. Wow! But I had some sort of a quasi, police function where I stood by and directed people or something. Uh, but you were on the side of the protests. You weren't. Oh yeah. You, yeah. you, you weren't yeah. a jackbooted thug. Yeah, and I went to, <laughs> uh, uh, my college was Brandeis. Okay. Which was very left wing, and they were like. Uh, classmates with uh, Susan Sachs and uh, who was the other student? They robbed a bank. Oh, wow. And a policeman was killed. And one of them, I think it was not Susan Sachs, the other one, I can't remember her name, was on the lam for like 20 years. And she turned herself in finally. And uh, yes, it was very, the school was extremely left-wing and had a sort of reputation of being radical. Uh, Jane Fonda, uh, she didn't attend, but she was there yeah yeah the, <laughs> inserting yeah. herself <laughs> when, when she was an anti-war activist yeah, right? yeah. yeah 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 my mom kind of hates her <laughs> and i don't know why because right. she seems like a nice lady but like that's one of those generational things you know right. like like there's a whole generation of people that hate smashing pumpkins and i'm like you guys just don't know their good <laughs> albums <laughs> you just know right. the the terrible stuff that came right. at the end which so, is how i feel about aerosmith go ahead <laughs> right. so i wouldn't want to mislead and say that i was a super activist i was, I was no, not no, but, no. It, but it was definitely part of the milieu sort of yeah, yeah it would be like uh, what the kids are interested in now um, you know, where we're like, it's the, it was also part of the cultural current where so it was hard. Like, uh, it, I think it, it seems like at the time it would have been more of a, um, more like unhip to be against, uh, to be for the war. Right. Well, a lot of people were, uh, were, but like, were but, for the war. But not poor people? <laughs> or, I don't know. We'll, we'll actually explain it to me. Because I remember the Iraq war very differently than most people nowadays that are still yeah. alive. So right. I'd love to hear your take on it. Since you were there and I only don't know anything. <laughs> well, I mean, the people who were opposed to the war were sort of the left wing, uh, tended to be uh, more, a I think more affluent probably. Oh, okay. Liberal, affluent, sort of they, left, left, left political sort of the same thing people say to Democrats now. Elitist. They were they were accused of being elitist. Sort yeah, of. but they're not anti-war anymore. They're elitist without being anti-war, which is what who, who the these? Democrats. <laughs> well, they're... Uh, it depends on which war you're talking about. They're the Yemen in, War. <laughs> that just ended, but like, you know. Right. I mean, they're, they're in favor of supporting um, uh, Ukraine. They're not... They're not interested in going... The United States going to war, at least so far. Yeah. But... Uh, but yeah, of course. They, they well, like I mean, I'm I'm talking. Sorry, we can move on. But I'm talking more about like the coups that Hillary Clinton is responsible for in Haiti and in Honduras, and the, the, you know, like it's never ending. <laughs> but but I'm just saying that like that that there used to be an anti-war movement and in in the country, and like people were aware. Like people don't even know how many wars we are in, and I think that kind of ended with the the Bush administration. Does that make sense? Um. Uh... Well, yeah, yeah. yeah like, how many wars are we in? I don't even know. Well, we don't know all of this. <laughs> Some people know, but... Uh, yeah, the generals. You know, if, you st if you studied it, you probably might know. But anyway, yeah. we don't have to talk about war. I'm more interested in, what, in your perspective of the, of the Vietnam War than I am in my perspective, which I already know. Well, I mean, the Vietnam War, the perspective we have now was probably... I mean, it's, it's like a lot of things that had good intentions, maybe. yeah where that we thought that uh, policymakers thought that uh, we needed to do it, mm -hmm. that there was this threat, a communist threat, and we heard all the horror stories about communism and mm -hmm. therefore it should be opposed. But it was, uh, it was, but it turned out to be very different because uh, it was more like a civil war. Uh, yeah, that we got involved in. Right, and uh, yeah, and France before us. Yeah, what, you say something, that you, like I feel like the left from your era is different than the left now. Right. Like they were not, I think when it's the things that I learned from Vietnam vets were that censorship is wrong, that the CIA is not a great thing. 
with the FBI is maybe not a great thing. And I think no. I feel like th- like now the the outspoken left, that neoliberal left, is very much the antithesis of like a lot of that Abby Hoffman radical stuff that we were right. alluding to. Well, it is. You're right. The things that liberals are now more likely to support Ukraine war, you might yeah, say. Yeah. Whereas in the Vietnam area, they were opposed to it yeah. that war. Whereas n- and now the conservatives, the, the are these are opposed to supporting. They're more they're more interested in uh, isolate in isolationism or not support. Yeah. So there has been that flip. But it's it really, crazy. It, it really depends on. But I wouldn't say it's a world outlook on the, necessarily on either side. Maybe it's a question of what war you're talking about or what policy you're talking about. I think there's like really not an anti-war movement that's allowed to be covered. Like, like I feel like during the Iraq War, there were outspoken voices in media. Anyway, like I'm, I'm, I'm less interested in the politics. Right. <laughs> I, I, I'm like I spend way too much time and it wrapped up in all of this shit. Right. But um, what, what do you, what were your takeaways? Uh, takeaways from the '60s. Let's not talk about the now people because yeah. the now people are the problem. The, the right, ones right, that are gonna right. censor me. <laughs> well, it was an amazing uh, series of events. The war was amazing. How it didn't turn out. We lost the uh, policymakers decided ultimately not to pursue it, and at some point it shifted from winning to how to get out. Uh-huh. Uh, with Linda and Johnson, you know, that, you have maybe it occurred there, where he realized that he was trapped no matter what he did. If he went, if he uh, <clears throat> if he got into the war more, he'd be blamed for that. If he pulled out, he wouldn't be blamed for that. And then Nixon came along, and it was amazing. That's how they got out. Yeah. You know, there's amazing pictures. Basically, Saigon just sort of collapsed. You know, there's amazing pictures of people hanging onto helicopters. And, yeah. And Which we saw like again that. with, uh, with what's it called, with Afghanistan, right. the withdrawal. Right. I mean, it, I think it, 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 uh, it was sort of a lesson. I think most people say, well, this is a lesson. We have to be much more careful about getting into wars. And then we were in Afghanistan for 20 years. <laughs> right. And then we, the big mistake was, Afga- it was, it was Iraq. Yeah. Most people seem to think now it was a mistake. We didn't learn our lesson there. Well, Joe, I mean, Bush, uh, Bush too said, we, we're not, I'm not into nation building, but in fact, that's what he tried to do. Yeah. Uh, you know, so. What, um, were, were, were you in college during the, the like, is yeah. that, is that why you didn't get drafted? Uh, or did you dodge the draft like a bad hippie? <laughs> uh, uh, the draft was going on, yeah. yeah. And uh, if you if you were in college, you were deferred. Yeah, yeah. But uh, at one point, I decided to take a year off in which I became eligible for the draft. So I... Uh, and I was pretty sure I would not, because of a history of asthma, which I don't have anymore, that I would not be accepted. Uh-huh. So I volunteered for induction meaning you volunteered to join the army. And you could uh, withdraw at any, you could change your mind on your induction at any time. So I volunteered for induction, went to the physical exam, and I flunked. Mm. So uh, I had two reasons why I was not draftable. Yeah. Mm. So That's crazy, because now they're like letting, you know, <laughs> they, they're constantly I, expanding the... <laughs> I don't even know the status of the... Do you still have to register these days for the draft? There's no draft. That, the, well, that that's how they keep doing all the wars. They learn from that. You, If you don't have like... If you have an all-volunteer army of poor people, like you don't... Right. You don't like... The, but you don't even have to register anymore in case there is a draft. I mean, I, I think I think I did. I think I it's I was it was I was eighteen, so I think I did at one point. Yeah. You're you're right. You do still do it, but like I don't. I mean, I remember when like the Ukraine war was happening, and I was still working in uh, in retail, and there were all these like young people that were like hanging right. around, and and they were like, "Do you think we're gonna get drafted?" I'm like, "You guys don't know anything." <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the vol- voluntary army is is uh, interesting, uh, but uh, yeah, it means we can have a war without really. Yeah. Anyone paying the price, yeah. basically. Yeah, I mean, they pay the price, but they're just in contra- under contract. Yeah. Yeah. I saw, well, some people are affected by it, but on the, the nation as a whole, country as a whole, when they were doing Iraq, it was just something you read about in the newspaper for yeah. the vast majority of people. Yeah. I think. Uh, so it's an, it, you know, but uh, where some people think, well, when we're really fighting, we we should make everyone 
people would be more realistic about going to war. Oh, a hundred percent. If yeah. the, if the pain were spread around. Yeah, I right. mean that's why that war was like not sustainable, you right. know. And then I, just even the journalism at the time, it's crazy. So, but it. it's it, What about the uh, what about the free love movement and all of that? Because that's really <laughs> what people want to know. <laughs> the free love movement. So like uh, the summer of love. That was what sixty nine. I had some friends who went to, was it 69? That was when Charles Manson, was it 60 or 68, 69? Oh, I'm thinking about, uh, was it 60, so it was in the 60s that, that Manson murdered? Well, the late 60s was crazy, yeah, because it, it appeared to be crazy to people because of this, you know, the San Francisco phenomenon, the drugs, marijuana was the first time it really got a lot of uh, consumers, I guess yeah. you could say. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, yeah, it was there. I had never. I had friends who went to the hate Ashbury and stuff, but they, uh, I didn't, and neither did they. Did get totally involved. I didn't go to Woodstock. It was sort of like, not. It didn't really interest me for some reason. Going but to what, Woodstock and that stuff, I it didn't appeal to me to go there. And but is it was it was out. was it a was it a thing that was happening everywhere? Because that's kind of the impression we're given. But it's the way you're saying it. It sounds like it was isolated to like very specific events and whatnot. Was there a sense, like, I mean, obviously there weren't people having sex in the streets, but, like, but but it was there, like, um, like, there's a lot of movies, even from the 70s, like, what's it called, the, uh, or it's not in the, in the, from the 70s, it was made, and it's about, it's set in the 70s, um, the ice storm, where people are, like, go to a key party, like, how prevalent was that kind of stuff? The key party. What's the key party? Even oh, okay. Then it wasn't prevalent at all. <laughs> uh, key party is where couples go to a party and they put their keys in the bowl and then the wife goes and oh, takes wife a key. Wife swapping. Yeah, sort yeah. Of wife or, swapping. Or, or, or free love. Just any any kind right. of like hip, gr smelly, gross hippie orgies. I, I mean, I, I probably wouldn't have partaken either. <laughs> I probably would have been with you on that. I'm just curious of like how, because the way that, you know, like the way that nostalgia works, I see people talking about the 90s and I'm like, that's not quite what the 90s were. You can't really kind of replicate it. So yeah. when I watch like 1960s movies and, or 1960s nostalgic stuff made in the 90s, my mom would also tell me like, that's not how it was. So is it is that like... It, I mean, it wasn't... Uh, you would... For, my, for me, you yeah. would hear about it maybe, but it wasn't an everyday thing. It's like... Uh, Part part of it is the media depiction. They you assume it's everywhere. It's like things happening now, like transgenderism or something. It's something that most people are never going to come across. Yeah, and that they have these, they have, they have violent opinions about it. Yeah, they want to do all these things. It's sort of like that. Hey, Ashbury, we've got a lot of press, but, but it didn't. It wasn't happening in Washington D.C. I don't think. Yeah, uh, or anywhere else. I mean, it was mostly college campuses, I guess, and stuff like that. Yeah, but it was never all that widespread i don't think in my opinion it was yeah. more of more of media type thing yeah That's but, it was, so but it was definitely there but it was but it, it wasn't so much the actuality of it maybe as as the attitudes uh -huh. that it was perfectly okay to do it even if people weren't having like orgies and stuff it was perfectly acceptable among a certain opinion group that this was perfectly fine it was more an, it was more, I think that's a better way to say it. It's more the change in attitude rather okay. than like women's liberation was beginning and uh, uh, gay liberation, <clears throat> black liberation, all those things. Yeah. The 60s was the heart of the civil rights movement, you know, when civil rights movement was finally getting some traction, although it's still a long way to go. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, you know, so, that, I mean, I, to me that's what was right. It's the change in attitude rather than maybe... Like an overall, yeah, yeah. Because when you see, you you see, you only see where the cameras are pointing, right? And then right. they never show you the cameras that weren't pointing at that stuff, right? Because right. <laughs> it's less interesting, <laughs> right? What about, uh, 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 man? I'm just, I'm, I feel like such a dork. But, but what about the Kennedy assassination? <laughs> what was that like? <laughs> uh, I was coming back from uh, gym class. Okay. And these people were crying. These girls were crying. I said, oh, shit. <laughs> Why are you crying? And they said, oh, the Kennedy was that. And I said, I thought it was, I didn't believe it. Yeah, I yeah. At first, I thought it was a joke. But then you get in. And at the time, they had loudspeaker. I don't know what they have in schools now, but they have loud 
no one had iPhones or phones. Mm-hmm. And they announced that they would miss test. I think they sent everyone home early. Yeah, yeah no shit. Yeah. I wonder, I don't think they did that for 9-11, which is crazy too. Well, 9-11, I was in Washington. Yeah. And I could see the smoke coming from the Pentagon. Whoa. And there were some people at work who were driving past the Pentagon when the plane went right over them and damaged something, hit their windshield. Uh, yeah. Wait, so like a piece of shrapnel hit their windshield? Something hit their car. Yeah, their car was slightly damaged, but they drove. It, it, they weren't. Uh, it was just like a little chip of something. It was a highway. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which was right next to the Pentagon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But either they were slightly after, enough after it so that they, the car got hit by something, but it didn't injure them. Yeah. And we were across the river, and we could see the smoke coming. We didn't know what it was. It was like, uh, I was walking past the conference room, and uh, this is one of those things where, what were you doing when such and such happened? No, that's why I tied but, them but, two, two together, yeah. But uh, <laughs> when you walk past, I was walking past the conference room. All these people were walking at a TV, and I didn't pay any attention. But then on the way back to my office, they were watching the TV, and the one of the towers had been hit. And then the second one hit, and then they collapsed. The second one collapsed. And then there were uh, <clears throat> reports that they were clearing out the Capitol and the White House and so forth because it was another plane. And they'd shut down all the planes, but there was one in the air still heading for Washington. Yeah. And then there were those, uh, subsequently found out that there was brave people who attacked the cabin and brought the plane down, and they all died. But... Uh, I'm still not sure about that one. <laughs> uh, well, that's what the story was. Well, the people on the cell phone, I, I think they, people were, the cell phones worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. And they I were mean, talking about I, it. I know and, all the details about that. Yeah. That's, I, I, I definitely think that they're terrorists. But, oh, you saw that recently it came out that two of the, the, the attackers were CIA uh, recruits at some point. I didn't read the full thing really? in detail. No, I didn't read that. They were, I didn't read it in detail enough to say that they were like, it was related, but they may have been like scouted at some point. I don't yeah. know. So look into it, but it, uh, pretty decent report or pretty decent sources like the gray zone. We're talking about it. Um, but I'm more like, okay, so Jack Ruby shoots. Jack so, Ruby, so, yeah. so Oswald kills somebody. Right. Then Jack Ruby shoots him. What the fuck are you thinking? Uh, well, of course, that was like made for a conspiracy theory. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I want to get into. I mean, it's, you, know, it's, you can no, even tell me things that have been debunked that you believe. That, that's what I want to know. <laughs> well, I was, I'm kind of mainstream on the JFK assassination. I, you know, I haven't read the Warren report. Okay. But uh, as far as I know, they did a reasonably good job of figuring out what the story was. Okay. And uh, I, you know, I haven't heard anything that suggests to me that it wasn't some sort of a solo job by uh-huh. Lee Harvey Oswald. You know, so I, have you have you watched it, the Zemeckis film or whatever? <laughs> Zemeckis is the director of Back to the Future. Zapruta. <laughs> Zapruta. <laughs> I've read it, but I haven't analyzed. You know all the theories about it wasn't coming from the. Graphic. No, no. I mean the video, the video itself. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I haven't read any of the. I have not read anything. Oh, so about the this. shot. It really didn't come from the grassy knoll, or it came from the grassy knoll. It didn't yeah. come from the. Yeah, yeah. The book depository or whatever it was. So, um, you know, I, I don't know enough about it. Mm-hmm. Most things you don't know enough about. It's very interesting. You really don't know about most things other than what you happen to read. Yeah, so you yeah. have to judge who's who's reliable and who isn't. Who do you think it did? As for him, you, you think you think Oswald did it? Uh, to my opinion is that he probably did based on yeah, based on what I've read and so forth. I have no reason to believe he so did, you, he didn't do it. Yeah, because I mean he was a weird character too because he was like, um, well I know some people think that it was actually the CIA that accidentally shot him. I've heard that version. I mean yeah, where that there there's a guy who like and that that's why they're covering it up. But now that the CIA is not releasing or the FBI is not releasing that information that like should be grandfathered in or should be is on schedule to be released about the, that, I'm like, I'm not so sure about that. It was it's a, it was the Secret Service that sorry. Oh. So like a Secret Service agent, they're, they accidentally discharged their weapon. They were sitting behind him. And and that's well, why that, wasn't it caught on the Zapruder film? No, you know, I, I know, I know, I, I know, no. I'm I, just saying there's so it's but but all of that stuff. I think that the government leaves that shit cloudy so that it does get crazy, you know, like so that the ideas that like I think the more, I think it's a known fact that the more you withhold information, you know, 
the more people are going to make shit up. And I think there's a conscious decision that happens in there. And there's a benefit to have people making shit up about 9-11, all of these things. So that you can be, you can be like labeled as crazy. It's like the UFO thing too. Now, now UFO people aren't crazy anymore. Why? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> like I say, all these things, you only know what you read unless you're personally involved with it. Yeah. Yeah. Although I found when I was working for the government and when you, uh, when you were working on something and it got reported by the press, the press didn't quite get it right. You know, they really didn't know what was going on frequently. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you just sort of become skeptical about, uh, unless you're really personally familiar with something, you really can't yeah, yeah, for know sure. what the story is. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah, and I think that that's like what makes these things so crazy. They're fun, though. I think that like people have gotten a little bit timid about... Um, conspiracy theory just because of like QAnon and stuff because right. that that shit got a little out of hand but it's still fun <laughs> you know you never got into that that's not something for you i i don't pay any attention to conspiracy theory. you don't I'm, pay I'm sort of mainstream on that do you do you know what the what uh, the tom o'neill book there's a new tom o'neill book about mm -hmm. uh the um, about the story with uh with marilyn manson who you mentioned earlier Marilyn Man I Sorry, my, no, Charles Manson. Charles Manson. <laughs> you know, a lot of these people are trying to make money. Yeah, yeah. Like the guy who wrote the book on the, uh, from New Orleans, whatever his name was, about the Kennedy assassination. Which guy was that? I can't remember his name, but he wrote a book and he had this whole theory about the CIA did it or something. Yeah. They're trying to, part of it, they're trying to sell. Oh, no. I mean, and I love it. Sensationalism. <laughs> they, you know, they're trying to make a few, make some dollars off it. If they're not really objective or. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Tom O'Neill one is 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 interesting because he actually doesn't say what happened. He just says that the narrative of Marilyn Manson and the Helter Skelter narrative is is not doesn't make sense. And he shows a couple of things why. And he also sh points out that like uh, they would let Marilyn, oh, they would let Marilyn, they would let Charles Manson like off on petty crimes or on uh, like regularly. Like he would not get arrested for stuff. So I think that sort of the implication is that he was kind of, um, or the conspiracy theory, which is a fun one. I'm, it's not fact, it's a conspiracy theory. And it, it's so it's never going to be uh, possible to prove, but that basically he was kind of sent to discredit sort of the whole hippie. He was allowed to have the LSD and, and, and have free reign over the shit. But really like actually Tex Watson is the fucking psycho in the group. Like I, but I don't know if you ever really got into it. That like the, the, I'm a true crime nerd, so the Tate Lavianca oh. murders are are very oh, yeah, interesting. Yeah. No, I read the book by the prosecutor. I can't remember. Bugalosi or yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's that's who's he's, who who he's yeah. debunking. And like yeah. uh, like he he spent like 20 years uh, doing it. But uh, anyway, all of these like life events are so fascinating because even oh. even 9/11 just has all these conspiracy theories. I don't believe any of them. I I literally think that they just didn't care enough to stop it. <laughs> Well, they were caught unawares. They, they, they. Uh, uh, it was so unexpected. Uh, yeah, but but I, I, you remember the guy that had the. You remember the whole thing with the memo of the like uh, Bin Laden turned determined to attack the United States and all of that, like all right. that polemic that came out. I just think that, like you know, I just think that it was like sheer incompetence you know like i think right. that there were warnings but like they just didn't care yeah apparently there were warnings but the, yeah. the bush administration didn't they... all those all those guys are considered like were at the time were considered dumbasses like they were not yeah. like uh, wolfowitz and all those people like they were jesus christ that motorcycle scared the shit out of me <laughs> yeah uh what was i gonna say the uh I can't remember. So, like, what was your scene in that time frame? Like, what Which, what scene? What what did you get into? Like, what you're a very social guy. It's not like you, you know. I'm I'm almost surprised to hear you say that you're mainstream. <laughs> well, I consider my opinions, my political opinions, probably mainstream. Yeah, uh, leaning left, left center, I would say. Okay. As opposed to right center, our country's right center, but I'm left center. Uh, mm hmm. Uh, what I was into, I, I was into working a lot. Yeah, so you were just a workaholic, pretty much. Yeah. Did, I, did you? Were, did, were you like? My mom tells me that it was seen as uncool to be like somebody that drank alcohol. 
Now, Washington, D.C. Was, has one of the highest per capita consumptions of alcohol okay. in the country. But I didn't do all that much drink, drinking. Uh, but but you but but it wasn't like you weren't a bohemian is I guess what I'm getting no, at. No, I was definitely not a bohemian. I was you know probably would have been labeled as a uh, when my younger a yuppie or something like that. Uh huh. Because I uh, uh, you know bought a house in the inner city and fixed it up over a number of years, although I never finished it and uh, stuff like that and worked you know worked hard yeah. Uh huh. And that, it's so interesting. I like uh, I mean. It's a perspective that doesn't get a lot of like attention in terms of your people from your generation, right? Like the people that are celebrated are well, I mean, didn't you don't you have to be a hippie to be a yuppie first? No. No. no just no, no. yuppies were like 80s people that were interested in business. People yeah. wanted to get ahead, you know, they wanted to uh-huh. you know, get ahead professionally sort of or something like that. Yeah. And and uh, were you at odds with like would, did, did hippies hate you kind of thing? Did they think? Well, the were hippies you... were the '60s. They were all gone by the oh, 80s, 80s, 70s. Yeah, they were all gone. So, oh, well, and they had already sold out. Too. Well, they they had aged. They had, yeah, they had become they hippies. They had aged out of. Is that what you mean? Yeah, they they had aged out of hippiedom. Yeah. Yeah. And were something else. They were doing whatever they were doing. Yeah. But were you like a greed is good guy? Like, like, no, I was always lib. I was always, no, I was never, uh, you're never like oh, Gordon Gecko. Did it. <laughs> yeah. right. But, uh, but the, the American dream was sent, like, center stage for you. You wanted to have a house and, like, well, I, well, didn't want, I didn't want, want a want house a in the suburbs. And I, I was, uh, yeah, uh, among gay men who were buying, uh, property in these, uh, in, uh, inner city Washington. Okay. Although no one lived in my house. Uh, it was vacant when I bought it. Okay. So uh, that was the scene, sort of, yeah. Wait, so you you never wanted to have a family because no. you're a gay man. Okay. Yep. We never it never it's never come up, but oh, yeah. <laughs> it also right. seems rude to ask. Right. But um so then were you was that like how was that to be a corporate person in that space? Washington DC was very liberal. So they, it never they, was an issue? It was never an issue. Really? And, no, they made it they made it they were politically correct on the issue to the like umpteenth degree, right? Mm-hmm. So there was, it was never a problem. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I never felt uh, discriminated against or anything like that. No. no. But, and then I guess since you're out from Alexandria, there was no like going home to somewhere kind of fucked up because it's like right there. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, like, yeah. it's a suburb, essentially. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So then, and when you say you moved in, you bought a house in the city, you mean Washington? Like, yeah. Washington what part? What, what what area? Uh, it's like 14th and you, Logan Circle. Logan Circle. Okay. Logan Circle, uh, yeah. Interesting. Anything that I haven't asked you that you maybe want to talk about? Because I, like, I feel like I'm expecting you to have uh, big opinions about stuff. And you, because to me, they're mythos, mythological in my brain. <laughs> like, like the Kennedy assassination, yeah. the, all of these things. And well, I feel I'm, like I'm disappointing you well, no, as, I feel a, like as, I'm, a, as an, as an interviewer, I'm, because I'm like interested in all the wrong things. And well, I, I feel maybe, like I'm disappointing you. Cause no, I don't you're have not any, like these, you know, no, I'm you're gonna, not, you're not. But what you're doing is you're, you're schooling me and you're educating me on how, <laughs> like how, 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 um, how much of that is propaganda. Like, like you have, it sounds like you, it's this is fascinating. You as a gay man in the sixties, seventies, and like born in the fifties, but living through the sixties, seventies, and eighties, like were at, at not an. I don't mean this as a derogatory term, but a square. Like, would you say that or like it, from the perspective of every all the wiling out hippie dudes that were like trying to go and do the free love thing and all of that? Uh, well, you felt separated from it. Because you weren't, uh, if you were gay, you felt separated from that. It really wasn't your scene. So there was not... Your scene was the gay scene, if anything, right? And was there like a free love gay scene? Or was that just... I, I had friends who went to orgies. I never did. They all yeah. they all got AIDS, but yeah. I didn't, you know. And uh, they're still alive, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it was separate, yeah. Wow, man. I, it's, it's just, it's so, it's so interesting. It really is. Like, I... I, I the the show used to have an introduction that I cut out because it's just too long, but it's like explore and expand worldviews. And I think that like all of my preconceived notions of like what the 60s, 70s and 80s were like, because I mean, I was alive in the 80s, but I first of all, I didn't even live here. I lived, you know, abroad. Well, the, the, yeah. 
I mean, the gay scene has totally changed. It, to some extent, it was underground mm -hmm. when I first began to participate in it. It was like, you know, it had that uh, out, strong outsider uh, feeling to it, mm -hmm. which is kind of exciting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, outlaw, sort of. Yeah, yeah. But that's totally changed. It's not, and now, <laughs> now it's like, uh, it, it's sort of banal at this point. Yeah, you know it's perfectly ordinary. They're 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 no longer gay ghettos, really. I guess some in West Hollywood maybe, but uh, even that mo now they're all living in the suburbs or wherever. You know. Did you feel like a deviant? Is that like no, what? I, I never felt deviant. No, I felt normal, basically mainstream. But but but, you, but it made it exciting that it was taboo. That's what that's kind sort of sort of yeah. I I don't use deviant as a negative. I call myself a degenerate. So, <laughs> 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 but um, but yeah. And, and how does it like? How does that work out though? Like, where do you, where, how do you become aware of where, how, how you're feeling and all of that? Like, it, did you ever come out to your parents and stuff? Was it ever? I hidden? never told them. It was funny. I never was like open in the sense of being out where I make declarations mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. But people knew for some reason. They yeah. didn't know. And uh, but like your parents, your parents never knew, or they did. They knew. But, they, but it just, it was never like a hey mom I'm right yeah, I never like, like came out in that way no. yeah no. but you never had a roommate uh no you were you had partners uh no L uh -oh. I had no partners no so I mean boyfriends or whatever yeah occasionally yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. 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 like but I'm just, I'm just saying like the the difference between like a roommate the euphemism and that's what I mean. Like you never had a quote unquote roommate because you were hiding the fact oh, that no, you were no, dating a no, person. No, no, yeah, I see right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, right. Yeah, yeah, man. It's I. I just remember as a as a young man, like it being kind of crazy and just being nervous about like where I would fall on that thing uh, on that like spectrum, What's, right? What spectrum? On the Kinsey scale or whatever it's oh. called, you know, like on on like, because yeah. like there was a in my generation there was a lot about androgyny, you know, like that was like that. I think that that would be the equivalent hipness thing to like non-binary now, where right. it's like it was like this. You had the Calvin Klein ads. It all comes from corporate like marketing too, which is really interesting. Yeah. But I remember like, uh, what's it called? I remember, I remember the act of defiance. Like I did, I kissed a dude on a play in a stage and like, I didn't think it was a big deal, but it was kind of like people would tell my friends like, Oh, Hey, I saw this happen. And like, I, I was never, I mean, I'm like full on straight, <laughs> yeah. but when you're like a kid and you're like oversexed and there's all these things happening in culture, like right. I, I just, it, it was crazy, but I remember being afraid. You know, so it's yeah, yeah. really it's really interesting to hear that like you, you there was that even in that time frame, Washington was liberal enough that you didn't feel like any of that shame or no. Well, I had friend to some extent. I had, I had friends who knew, and they it was sort of I could tell for them, it sort of made them more sophisticated to say, well, I know this gay guy, you know, I know this uh... gay people, you know, it made them more worldly. Sort of, it was far from being you know something to be. To, uh, but you never took that as like a microaggressive thing, where they're no, like, no, 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 no. Okay. So it was, uh, yeah, it was at least in my, my Amelia, it was not. I mean, I'm sure there must, I'm sure there were people who were conservative about it. But, but then, and then when you say your scene, you were like the the gay scene. What it, what does that entail? Well, it, for me, I was living in like a gay. There were a lot of gays moving into my neighborhood. Okay. And there were gay bars. You would go to the gay bars, that kind of thing. That's what it was. And what, like, what kind of, what kind of music? What, what, is it, was there ever well, any started, clubbing? When it or? first started, it was like disco. Okay, that's what. It, yeah, yeah that's. I, 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 I didn't want to be like offensive, but that's exactly what I was getting at. <laughs> so right. you, you used to start do the disco scene. Well, I went to some, some bars from time to time. Yeah, I was never really good disco dancer at all. Uh huh. And then I don't know what happened after disco. It was sort of ended, and then. And then it just became like pop. Then. Pop Some, music, yeah. yeah. The, the '80s or the '80s came along, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and everything changed. There were still bars. There still are bars now. Of course, now my the gay scene I think now is mostly online. My, yeah. For my impression is, yeah. Do you still have like a very gay social circle that you can interact with, or? Uh, I have some, yeah, not no, a lot. Not some, a lot, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. I've I've never really considered 
the possibility of it having of, of it having been okay just because in the 90s i was so stressed out about it as a straight person that like well it was always an issue you felt a little bit uneasy that you know it was always that it was you know you but you would never knew if people like, were going to be mean I, I never expected to be beaten up or yeah yeah fired and you know at some point the federal government changed the rules so that they couldn't fire you based uh -huh. on orientation so and all of the most businesses and so forth did the same thing you know yeah major businesses yeah well cool man i really feel like i got a sense of who you are like i i i know that you feel like my expectations suck <laughs> uh, <laughs> or my you, what i'm saying is that like i like learning the reality like i i, I don't need someone to be performative to me it's mm -hmm. fascinating who you actually are oh, you know good. like in, in terms of because it it does kind of uh it really makes sense like uh and it's it sort of makes the world feel like more less less heightened in terms mm -hmm. of like the hysteria of like all the dangers that are always happening, you know, mm -hmm. like I feel like culture is very much about fear and very much about like, oh no, it's bad things are going to happen. Bad things are going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then to go back and, and, and hear this whole experience of like you just being mainstream <laughs> is so comforting to me in, a, in such a specific uh -huh. way, you know, does that, th does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I think most gays are probably like that. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, don't I just think, I mean, I don't, I don't think all of them are I, on the streets all the time. You know, it's like, what do you like, mean on the streets? Well, demonstrating or whatever. no, but I just, but I, I mean, the difference between a gay person now and the difference between a gay person during the Stonewall riot, riots, I don't even think that in nineties were the hardest part for it. So, so I'm just saying, and, and but like, it's nice to know that there were places growing like for you in the eighties, you know, cause you, you like, I mean. Well, it was very different. I read a book about Frank Kameny, who was, he was a Harvard, he went to Harvard in astronomy, and he got fired by the Defense Department. He had some minor indiscretion mm -hmm. years before that they found about, so they fired him. And he spent the, most of his adult life uh, litigating that issue. Yeah. He demonstrated, he, they demonstrated the White House in the 1950s, you know, homosexual rights mm -hmm. in the 1950s. Now that was brave. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you know. Uh, no, I mean, I don't. I like. I guess what I'm learning is that there were there was necess wasn't necessarily a full need to be brave all the time. You know, no, like like all. you could no. just be a person, and that's that's actually really refreshing and, and a really interesting thing no, to yeah, I'm glad to, to, that. Yeah, to, to learn. You know, because yeah. yeah, like, yeah. I I mean, nowadays I don't really think it, it, like I I think it's very different. It's it's hard to imagine that when now every company is like supportive and and you know has gay people in their commercials and stuff like that you yeah. know and not growing up with that is is uh is is just like it just seems like we've made a lot of progress but it's it's nice to know that it wasn't always that bad every single place you know like right now there's there's some there's 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 like parts of the world that the world has ended but it's nice to know that in this room it's not you yeah. know <laughs> like there are post-apocalyptic yeah. landscapes right i mean the 50s and 60s i'm sure we're, we're definitely different i'm quite sure yeah yeah all right man anything that we could what well, we were at your show thanks again to last for uh, to last po uh, last projects uh for letting us record here uh anything that we can promote for you you are patrick j donovan on uh, uh, instagram uh, right uh patrick james donovan james donovan on Instagram, that's also my website. Yeah, and there's a uh, artist talk on the seventh here, here at four p.m. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, no, it's it's always a pleasure to to talk Great. to people that have Good. different perspectives that can teach me about how Good. how limited my scope well, is. <laughs> I, I, well, I'm glad it was an educational experience for you. <laughs> oh no, now I feel like I've offended you. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, they are all supposed to be. Right. All right, uh, and then we'll be back next week with another guest with another topic that may or may not be art related. And thank you so much for uh, to, uh, for to Patrick and for you guys for watching.